Hey, I'm Justin, and I'm going to show you a problem that I came across when my data structures textbook didn't provide the proof for a really interesting little mathematical fact, and how that problem led me to making my first ever discovery in the world of computer science that actually challenged what was written in that textbook. More on that at the end. I hope you enjoy. Let's say you have a binary tree. That is a data structure composed of connected nodes that can each have up to two children. The nodes at the bottom of the tree, with no children, are called the leaf nodes, and the node at the top of the tree, with no parent, is formally called the root. Informally, it's called an orphan. The size of a tree is the number of nodes it has, so 15 in this case, and its height is the number of levels it has, minus 1. So this tree has a height of 3, and an empty tree of size 0 would have a height of negative 1. We call a tree balanced if, for every non-leaf node, the heights of its left and right subtrees differ by at most one. Now I know that's kind of a lot to take in, so let me show you an example. Here, the left and right subtrees of the root both have a height of two, so their difference is zero. These two have heights of one and zero. One minus zero is one, so they still follow the balancing rule. The same goes for these two. 0 minus negative 1 is positive 1, so all's good. However, moving on to the right side, this left subtree has a height of negative 1, but the right subtree has a height of positive 1, meaning their difference is 2. Therefore, this tree is unbalanced. If we wanted to balance it, we could add another node here, so that the left subtree would have a height of 0, and their difference would only be 1. With these definitions out of the way, the question that naturally follows is, for a balanced binary tree with n nodes, what are its minimum and maximum possible heights? I encourage you to try this problem out for yourself and come back whenever you're ready. It can be helpful to consider the reverse of this question. For a balanced binary tree of height h, what are its minimum and maximum possible sizes? This is the question I'll be starting with. To give this problem some labels, I'll call a balanced binary tree's minimum possible size pH and its maximum possible size qH, where h is the height. Let's start with the maximum because it's the easier of the two to find. We start with an empty tree, which we know has a height of negative 1, and its maximum size is 0. Once we add a node, its height becomes 0 and its maximum size is 1. For h equals 1, since we want to give this tree as many nodes as possible, we'll give the root node two children, making the tree's size three. For h equals two, we can give both of these leaf nodes two children for a total of seven nodes. We'll repeat this again to get a tree of height three with its maximum possible size of 15. It's pretty easy to see that if we make every non-leaf node have two children, the tree will have the maximum number of nodes. But how many is this? Well, since the capacity of each level doubles as you go down the tree, the sum for this tree would be 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1st up to 2 to the 4th. And this is equal to 2 to the power of 5 minus 1. Now we can generalize this to say that qh is equal to 2 to the power of h plus 1 minus 1. And going back to the original problem, we need to solve for h which yields that the log base 2 of qh plus 1 minus 1 is equal to h. But recall that qh is the maximum possible size of the tree, so n will be at most qh. Therefore, the ceiling of the log base 2 of n plus 1 minus 1 will be less than or equal to h. And I just added the ceiling function because we know that h is an integer. So there's the lower bound on the height. We're already halfway done. Or, well, kind of. Let the amount of time left in this video be the indicator of that. Now we're on to the trickier but far more interesting part of this problem of finding the upper bound on the height of a balanced binary tree. Or, in reverse, the minimum possible number of nodes for a given height, which we call pH. Again, we'll start drawing some trees, starting at h equals negative 1, where the minimum size is unsurprisingly 0. And I'm going to use this set notation here at the bottom to express pH so that we can see all the values that we've calculated at once. That'll be important soon. 
For h equals 0, the minimum and maximum number of nodes is just a single node. Not too many options there. For h equals 1, the minimum number of nodes is 2, one on each level. Moving on to h equals 2, we can't just have a single line of nodes again, because then the heights of the left and right subtrees differ by 2, which violates the height balancing rule. To correct this, we need to add another node here, balancing out the tree for a total of 4 nodes. Next is h equals 3, and once again we can add nodes to keep the tree balanced, like this. So p3 is equal to 7. The process is the same for h equals 4, but I'll spare you all the details and just show you that the tree needs at least 12 nodes. Now this is a perfectly valid way to generate these size minimized balanced trees, but it will take exponentially longer to do so as the height increases, so we'll need a better way. It's important to note that for all of these trees, the left and right subtrees of any non-leaf node differ in height by exactly one. If they were to be the same height, that would be wasteful and use unnecessary nodes. So for h equals 5, one of the root subtrees, let's say the left one, must have a height of 4. And the other one, the right one, must have a height of 3 to minimize the size of the tree. And these subtrees themselves must be balanced. However, instead of generating them from scratch, we can just look at the work we've already done, because the previous two trees had heights of 3 and 4. So finishing this tree is really just a matter of copying and pasting. We already have the tree of height 4 right here, so if we take the tree of height 3 and connect them by the root, we will have a balanced tree with a height of 5, and we can see that it has 20 nodes. Let's do the tree for h equals 6. The left subtree must have a height of 5, which we already have right here, and its right subtree will have a height of 4, which we can just bring back from earlier. Now we just have to connect them by the root, and that's it! 33 nodes. This process could go on forever, and this means that the size of this tree is equal to the sum of the sizes of the previous two trees, plus 1 for the root node, giving us this equation. But this looks extremely familiar. It is almost identical to the equation for the Fibonacci sequence. And actually, it's the reason why these trees are called Fibonacci trees. And if we compare the values we found for pH with the Fibonacci sequence, we can see that they are all one less than a Fibonacci number. Specifically, they're one less than the Fibonacci number at index h plus 3, giving us this equation, which is super useful. But there's just one problem. How do we calculate the nth Fibonacci number? The equation that we currently have is called a recurrence relation, meaning that it is recursive and depends on previous values in the sequence, which in turn also depend on previous values. So if we could take a guess at a concrete expression to represent each term in the sequence, that would really simplify everything. So let's look back at the Fibonacci sequence and see if we can compare it to some other sequences. Let's start with an arithmetic sequence, an, which increases linearly by b. To be clear, we're not trying to find an exact match. We're just trying to find a type of sequence that somewhat resembles the Fibonacci sequence as a starting point. For the sake of example, I'll set b equal to 2, but we can already eliminate this as a possibility because the difference between two adjacent terms in the arithmetic sequence remains constant, while in the Fibonacci sequence it is strictly increasing. Next, we'll look at a geometric sequence, which increases exponentially by a factor of x. Again, for this example, I'll set x equal to 2. This looks far more promising. The differences here are strictly increasing, just like we want, and while I know this is unique for x equals 2, each of the differences is an element in the sequence, just like in the Fibonacci sequence. This gives me hope that we're on the right track and we're probably looking for some kind of exponential. So let's set a n back equal to x to the power of n and give it the same recurrence relation as the Fibonacci sequence. Simple substitution will give us this equation, and now solving for x is not too hard, because when n is equal to 2, we get the quadratic, x squared equals x plus 1, which we can rearrange and solve with the quadratic formula. So x is equal to 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 all over 2. You may recognize the positive solution of x as the famous golden ratio, commonly denoted as phi. 
the negative solution, through some clever rearranging which I'll leave up to you, is equal to 1 minus phi, giving us our two solutions for x. I'll keep those up in the corner for now. So let's solve for the first few terms in the sequence. x to the zeroth is 1, x to the first is x, and we already know that x squared equals x plus 1. Next is x cubed, which equals x squared plus x, but the x squared can be further expanded to get x cubed equals 2x plus 1. Then we have x to the fourth, which is equal to x cubed plus x squared, but we can expand that to x squared plus 2x plus 1, which in turn is equal to 3x plus 2. Moving on to x to the fifth and performing the same expansion yields that it's equal to 5x plus 3. And you could keep doing this ad infinitum, but I'll just show a couple more. And I'll rewrite the first few terms up top so that everything looks a little bit more consistent. At this point, you may notice something really interesting. For all x to the n, the coefficient of x in each expansion is the nth Fibonacci number, and the constant term is the previous one, giving us this equation. Which is really awesome, because remember that this new sequence, x to the n, is entirely different from the Fibonacci sequence. But all we had to do was give it the same recurrence relation, and all of a sudden the Fibonacci sequence starts popping up, almost out of nowhere. And you could prove this equation using induction, however I'd like to show you a way of visualizing it that I think is more true to the essence of the problem at hand. What if we change the way we expand the sequence, and expand it like a binary tree? Let's take x to the 5th for example. We know that it expands to x to the 4th plus x to the 3rd, so let's make those two terms the two children of our root. And we'll continue like this, connecting each term with its expansion. Here's the result. But this tree's structure is familiar. This tree is balanced for one thing, but look at what happens if I overlay it on the Fibonacci tree of height 4. They're almost identical. The only difference is these ones in the leaf nodes. Let's try to unpack this. Each power of x is equal to the sum of the previous two powers of x, and each Fibonacci tree is composed of the previous two trees connected at the root. So essentially, they have the same recurrence relation. And since they do, it's really only logical that the coefficients in the equation in the top left corner are Fibonacci numbers. The question of which Fibonacci numbers can be answered by just looking at the first couple of terms in the sequence. For n equals 0, the coefficient of x is 0, and the constant term is 1. These are the zeroth and negative first Fibonacci numbers respectively. And yes, the Fibonacci sequence does expand into non-whole number indices. If you'd like to dive down that fascinating rabbit hole, I'll leave a link to an incredible video by Matt Parker in the description. For n equals 1, the coefficient of x is 1, and the constant term is 0. These are the first and second Fibonacci numbers. From there, the pattern plays out as expected because you're just following the rule of the Fibonacci sequence, where you add two consecutive terms to get the next one. Now let's understand why there are these extra ones in the leaf nodes. This tree has a height of 4, which is 1 less than the value of n, 5. So the same should go for all subtrees. The height of a subtree whose root is x to the third is 2, and it follows that the height of a subtree whose root is x to the zeroth, or 1, should be, in some weird sense, negative 1. That's not to say that this node doesn't exist, but just that it sort of represents an empty space, like the zero in the exponent would suggest. But let's not lose focus on this realization, this beautiful interconnectedness between the golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, and balanced binary trees. Not only is it a really interesting pattern, but it shows that these ideas are inextricably linked. You need the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio to understand this problem, but you can also use this problem and balanced binary trees to better understand the Fibonacci sequence, and even derive the golden ratio. How awesome is that? Now, going back to this equation, it may seem like this isn't helpful in our endeavor to solve for the nth Fibonacci number, because it still uses multiple terms from the sequence just like the recurrence relation. 
However, I invite you to take a look at the top right corner of your screen. There are two possible values of x. By using both of them as substitutions for x, solving for fn becomes as simple as solving a system of equations. Start by subtracting the two equations, then realize that this quantity on the right-hand side, phi minus 1 minus phi, is equal to the square root of 5, and from there you can isolate fn to get this equation. fn equals phi to the power of n minus the quantity 1 minus phi to the power of n, all over the square root of 5. This formula is really spectacular, but we are not the first ones to find it. Far from it. This is a very famous equation known as Binet's formula, but fun fact, Binet was actually not the first to discover it. The world of math has a tendency to do that. If we recall from earlier that pH is equal to the Fibonacci number at index h plus 3 minus 1, we can plug in Binet's formula to solve for the exact lower bound on the size of a balanced binary tree. Now all that's left to do is to answer the original question, and solve for h. Doing this is a little tricky, but I'm not going to show my work here. I encourage you to try solving it for yourself, but I'll also be posting a follow-up video just on solving this equation. Anyway, without further ado, here's the solution. And since pH is the minimum value of n, we can say that h will always be less than or equal to the same expression, but substituting n for pH, giving us an exact upper bound on the height of a balanced binary tree. Now let's put everything together and combine this inequality with the lower bound that we calculated earlier. And there is our final answer to the question. For a balanced binary tree with n nodes, its minimum height is the ceiling of the log base 2 of n plus 1 minus 1, and its maximum height is the floor of the log base phi of n plus 1.5 plus the log base phi of the square root of 5 minus 3. What a solution. But at the beginning of this video, I told you that I made a discovery. And while that is technically true, it's an incredibly minor one. Actually, it's an incredibly minor half. Let's take a look at the AVL tree Wikipedia page. Now, I'm sure you're wondering what an AVL tree is, but just know that it's a type of balanced binary tree that's commonly used for quickly storing and accessing data. If we scroll down to the properties section, there's some stuff written about the bounds on the heights of balanced binary trees. However, the definition of height used here is slightly different from the one we've been using throughout this video. Here, height is defined as just the number of levels, whereas we defined it as the number of levels minus 1, so all of their results will be 1 greater than mine. Still, there's one small difference between my answer and the one here. It's this 2, which in my answer is a 1.5. There are actually uncountably infinite numbers that you could put here that would always give you the exact upper bound on the height. To be more specific, any number on this interval would work. But 2 is not one of them. The reason why that is will be made clear in that follow-up video I mentioned earlier. But for now, it will suffice to just show an example where this expression does not yield the exact upper bound. When n equals 11, the maximum possible height is 3 which is exactly what the floor of my answer tells you. But when you plug 11 into this expression, adjusting for the differing definitions of height, you'll get a number just over 4. So this answer isn't really incorrect, it's just not as accurate as it could be. Who is responsible for this, you may ask? Just a man named Dr. Donald Knuth, the father of algorithmic analysis who created text and its default fonts both of which I'm using right now to display his name on the screen. So obviously, I mean no disrespect. This guy is a living legend, and it is truly an honor to not even find a mistake, but just something that could be optimized a little from his famous book, The Art of Computer Programming. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and have a wonderful new year.